Um, so Mike Schneider's here today. So welcome, Mike. It's, it's not very nice to have you giving a, a talk. So Mike finished his PhD at Irvine, I guess, last year, and is currently a, a postdoc um, at, the, at the Center for Philosophy of Science at Pittsburgh, although physically in um, South Bend, I guess, rather than, rather than Pittsburgh, since nothing's there. Okay, and today he's going to talk to us about um, Transplankian philosophy of cosmology. And I think for anyone who was um, in our last talk, uh, I guess two weeks ago with Robert Brandenberger, um, I think it's actually coming, you know, going to be talking about some uh, similar themes and, and questions. Okay, so please, Mike, take it away. Um, and about 45 minutes sound, sound good? Yep, sounds good. All right. Uh, all right. So um, in September of 2019, last year, uh, two papers were posted to the Physics Preprint Repository Archive, which together introduced the Transplankian censorship conjecture, uh, as Nick was just referencing. Broadly speaking, uh, the conjecture proposed that certain features of quantum gravity, which are relevant in the Planck regime in our universe, they could wind up severely constraining inflationary cosmology. Or vice versa, uh, given the conjecture, inflation could pose an issue for our thinking about quantum gravity. And so here, I'm going to try to isolate what it is, I think, which is supposed to be exciting about this new idea of transplankian censorship. And I'm going to do this in such a way that the source of the excitement can hopefully stand on its own legs, uh, which is to say, uh, stand essentially decoupled from the more narrow prospects of the conjecture as it happens to get formulated in its original context of invention, namely string theory. Uh, and I'll flag from the start, uh, Robert Brandenberger, who Nick mentioned, uh, gave a talk a couple of weeks ago in this Beyond Space Time series on the subject. Uh, he's an author of one of those original papers from last year. Uh, and he argued in the talk, uh, from the terms of the conjecture to a revision in our thinking about the early universe, uh, getting away from inflation. I'm going to go the opposite route. So I'm going to hold the early universe side of things fixed uh, in a manner of speaking uh, and focus on the other direction where our thinking about the early universe, the way we often do, uh, it forces our hand in quantum gravity research. Now I may be wrong about this, but I actually don't take these two projects, uh, these two directions to be in tension with each other. Uh, as I see it, switching between one and the other is just something like uh, a gestalt shift. So they're two sides of the same coin. Um, the final thing I'll say on this title slide, I'll self-identify here as a philosopher of physics. And meanwhile, I'm talking about some cutting edge, uh, Robert called them controversial developments in theoretical physics. So part of what I see myself doing here is uh, extracting what I think are the relevant aspects of the present conversation happening in theoretical physics. And I'm doing so in order to carve out some space for philosophical discussion, which enters at the ground floor of the new subject uh, or the new controversy even which evidently lives at the semi-classical frontiers of quantum gravity research. Uh, so hopefully this will all be to mutual benefit at the end of the day. So uh, to begin, this is how I'd like you to think about the Transplankian censorship conjecture in slogan form. So this is my own. Nature precludes the physical relevance of a large class of semi-classical field theories defined on cosmological space times. Now, these are effective field theories, which could otherwise be relevant to our understanding of uh, structure formation in early universe cosmology. And also maybe dark energy, but I'm not going to touch that bit. And I'll say why uh, later in the talk. So now nature precludes is a bit obscure language, granted, uh, but it emphasizes that this is all unsettled terrain until we have some future theory of quantum gravity which can serve as the truth maker of the conjecture. 
this is just to say that what makes the conjecture true or else what makes it false is unsettled and it's presently vague. So ostensibly this conjecture renders expectations about the future quantum gravity theory as constraints on our thinking about structure formation in the early universe, uh, which is also getting constrained by cosmological data. But oppositely, it renders early universe cosmology as we typically think of it as empirical evidence to bear on quantum gravity research. And this is actually, I think, the big insight in a nutshell. It couples together our thinking about a future theory of quantum gravity and our thinking about structure formation in the early universe. Now, my goal here is to argue that transplankian censorship is uh, plausibly the sort of thing that is worth holding on to. It's worth embracing given the local epistemic aims of a relevant research community. So it's the sort of thing that a quantum gravity theorist, perhaps not just string theorists, they could conceivably take steps to ensure that it winds up being true in our thinking about future theory. And the idea here is that they could take those steps specifically so as to reap the benefits of there being that coupling between uh, early universe cosmology and quantum gravity research, which I was just hinting. At. Uh, and that's really the funny thing about conjectures in theoretical physics. Uh, so Robert even referred to this particular conjecture as a postulate when he gave his talk. Uh, and I think this alternative choice of language is telling. It lets us ask, well, a postulate for what? And the answer, I think, is something like future physics on the whole of it. So future physics is something we bring about based on where we have come so far. So when we look at things like transplankian censorship and how it pairs with cosmology, it's worth keeping in mind that we could ultimately flip things around. And we could stipulate that the terms of the conjecture wind up true in retrospect. And this is essentially what I mean when I say that it could be worth embracing or worth holding on to, given the local epistemic aims of researchers. Now, uh, as I said, transplankian censorship has come out of string theory broadly with uptake by early universe cosmologists. But transplankian censorship is still new, um, particularly as a general semi-classical subject. So it may seem premature to discuss its prospects. And this is in sharp contrast with other similar cases uh, of philosophical interest, for instance, cosmic censorship or the cosmological constant problem. In those cases, the subjects being important so far in recent history, I think sometimes sounds like the primary justification for philosophically studying them. And if that's true, then the closest analogy here is something like a promissory hope. Something like, trust me, I think this new subject is going to be big. Now, uh, as much as I'd like to say something like that, uh, it can be quite difficult to spell out the difference between an act of measured foresight and an act of reading tea leaves, particularly conceiving uh, concerning unique and highly contingent events like this subject happening to become big. So it'd really be better to locate a, mot a reason motivating broad philosophical engagement with transplankian censorship, which is not reducible to a prediction about the future winds of research in the discipline. And so here are some reasons for engagement in brief. Uh, first, it could be helpful in motivating further research into the status of the conjecture in string theory or beyond if we first take steps to clarify why affirming or denying the conjecture matters at all in the course of ongoing research. And second, direct empirical constraints on quantum gravity research are in a sense hard to come by. And this conjecture lets us have more to that effect than we otherwise could expect to have. There's thus an immediate uh, pragmatic case for adopting the conjecture perhaps as what Adrian Curry has called in a more general context of historical sciences, 
and empirically grounded speculation. In this case, the thought is that we could perhaps happily bite whatever bullets come with our adopting the speculation. And so it might be good to investigate what are those bullets that we would be biting happily or otherwise. So now, uh, all that being said as a prelude, here's an outline for the rest of the talk. Uh, first, I'm going to argue a perspective on the relationship between lines of evidence in large scale cosmology and theory development in high energy particle physics. Uh, and I, I intend this perspective to be faithful to how that relationship is typically understood. That is to say, at least in one uh, corner of theoretical physics practice. And this corner may or may not be located in the Boston area uh, in Massachusetts predominantly. Now, from this perspective, uh, transplankian censorship is rendered productive for furthering frontier physics research. When one turns to consider uh, otherwise dim prospects of an analogous relationship between large scale cosmology and even higher energy physics, namely quantum gravity. And this is going to involve us getting clear about the Planck regime where quantum gravity reigns in our universe. And so that's the second part of the talk. And then in the final se section, I'll uh, present the conjecture in light of all of the setup. So here we go. The standard model of cosmology, lambda CDM, uh, constitutes our current best theory of the evolution of large scale cosmic structure. As a consequence of our embrace of lambda CDM, we are committed to the descriptive accuracy of a particular narrative of large scale cosmic history. To zeroth approximation, our universe exhibits always strictly positive cosmic expansion, wherein space has been uniformly expanding and cooling for all cosmic time. The evolution of any further non-trivial large scale cosmic structure is then studied uh, perturbatively given cosmic expansion in the background. Uh, but as one travels backward through cosmic time about any point, so that would be outward from the sun in this picture, large scale cosmic structure approximately uniformly contracts, growing hotter and hotter. Increasing temperatures, we eventually regard a semi-classical interpretation of quantum field theory on curved space-time, which is familiar from high energy particle physics, as descriptively relevant to questions about the formation of any non-trivial large-scale cosmic structure, still given cosmic expansion in the background. Now, in fact, we often take this line of reasoning even further, asking these quantum field theories to explain, by means of a semi-classical treatment of gravity as well, cosmic expansion itself during periods of suitably high temperatures, suitably early on. And in this way, the relevant quantum field theory winds up as a theory of structure formation, which modifies what we take to be the early history of the large scale universe. And this is the domain of early universe cosmology. The stuff that goes on in this picture out past the thin red ring that's very nearly along the edge. And this is contrasted with late stage cosmology, which is what goes on within or bounded by the thin red ring as depicted in the iris of this lovely picture. And so the most popular of this view uh, is that provided by um, inflationary cosmology. Inflationary cosmology refers to a class of scalar quantum field theories, which as theories of early universe cosmology support exponential rates of cosmic expansion for a very brief moment in time, very early on. And during this time, quantum fluctuations uh, about the zero point can moreover classicalize and thereby eventually seed the anisotropies present in the conditions observed at recombination. And that's the thin red ring in the picture, which delimits early universe cosmology from late stage cosmology. Now, uh, the upshot of all of this is that we may understand the high energy particle physics of early universe cosmology 
as seeding the evolution of large-scale cosmic structure in late-stage cosmology. Structure formation in the former, say, as in the case of inflationary cosmology, constrains what it is that is there to evolve according to lambda CDN in the latter at later stages. Now, uh, a typical view of the standard model of cosmology is that it showcases the gravitational degrees of freedom uh, in our universe, which are meanwhile regarded as the only degrees of freedom according to current fundamental physics that still matter once we've restricted our attention to the large scales that we ultimately uh, care about here in cosmology. And this focus on just classical gravity is precisely what goes away when we consider early universe cosmology. And that's why we start talking about uh, semi-classical structure formation. But at late stages, in the typical view, the focus on just gravity persists. But this view pairs poorly with what I said on the previous slide. Uh, as I was just describing it, the evolution of large-scale cosmic structure post-recombination is just that which evolves according to uh, relativistic dynamics given initial conditions. In fact, employing a relativistic perturbation theory on an expanding background goes nearly all the way toward describing our empirical record of the subject. And from this description, it sounds like what we have here is a case of what Mark Wilson has called semantic mimicry. Gravity as motivated by our current fundamental physics on the one hand, and evolution of large scale structure by the same dynamics on the other hand. So the former would direct our attention to thinking about fundamental high energy physical processes uh, causing what we see at large scales. But that isn't what's happening here in practice. Instead, our attention is directed toward thinking about the conditions that obtain at the relevantly large scales at recombination. And these conditions are due to the high energy physics characteristic of the early universe and are not due to the high energy physics characteristic of smaller scales within the late stage universe. So the conditions resulting from the early universe at recombination together with the relativistic dynamics are what are regarded as fully explaining the large scale cosmological record at late stages. So what's happening here is that lambda CDM is being treated uh, in the context of late stage cosmology as what Bob Batterman would call an autonomous theory, namely of the large scale universe at late stages. And this is a theory that proceeds of its own accord given boundary conditions specified at recombination. And those boundary conditions are input based on the output of a similarly autonomous theory of early universe cosmology. For instance, a particularly appealing inflationary scenario. So just as a slight aside, I think recombination, as I've been discussing it, is a prime example of what Julia Burston has called the model connecting function of boundary conditions in multi-scale modeling. And in this case, we're talking about the multi-scale modeling of cosmology or else the universe or maybe large scale universe, or really, I think that thing whose evidential window is primarily sky surveys and cosmic backgrounds. So the big pitch so far is that we think of recombination as a boundary between two theories otherwise taken to be autonomous as descriptions of the relevant systems. High energy structure formation in early universe cosmology and the classical evolution of cosmic structure in late stage cosmology. Based on this view, evidence gathered in the context of late stage cosmology evidentially constrains the high energy physics that's taken to be relevant in early universe cosmology by means of the shared boundary conditions that obtain at recombination. Uh, oppositely, the high energy physics relevant in early universe cosmology is what gives rise to the conditions that explain or predict 
the same empirical record. So the idea of handshaking algorithms from multi-scale modeling comes readily to mind here. Namely, there's a wedding of sorts, a long recombination between semi-classical observables as relevant in early universe cosmology and the classical initial data and constraints familiar in late stage cosmology. So now I want to introduce the Planck regime. Here's how the introduction goes. In the narrative I rehearsed earlier, early universe cosmology is born out of our reluctance to trust the study of, uh, to, our reluctance to trust uh, the relevance of a classical theory to the study of large scale structure once ambient temperatures get sufficiently high going backward in cosmic time. In fact, along the lines of what I was just saying, the converse is also going to be true, right? We're simultaneously reluctant to trust the relevance of the high energy semi-classical theory to the study of large scale structure when ambient temperatures are sufficiently low at late stages. But uh, likewise, in the, at least in the case of inflationary cosmology, temperatures eventually grow large enough as we move backward in cosmic time about any point in the early universe, that we come to abandon trust in the semi-classical theory as well. Instead, we regard a hitherto unknown theory of quantum gravity as that which reigns supreme. And this defines the Planck regime, a regime in which the bare structure of classical space-time is plausibly discarded. In this sense, the exit from the Planck regime gains the distinction of constituting the beginning of our large-scale semi-classical universe. So let's talk about this new regime. First, a big qualification. As we usually think of the Planck regime, this is really better considered as akin to an upper bound for how far back we can push the descriptive accuracy uh, of something like quantum field theory on curved space-time as it shows up. In inflation. And where we place this bound won't be too important for my talking about it. Uh, but it's worth flagging that it's somewhat of a fuzzy term or even a term of art for where we want to start quantifying our complete ignorance about the relevant physics, uh, at least for as long as we lack a theory of quantum gravity. And so maybe if I'm being honest, I should make this slide say this instead. And I'll share a historical quote in a moment that makes this sentiment explicit. Uh, for now though, I'll proceed talking with the usual phrase. Uh, so the Planck regime is sometimes referred to as the Planck epic. Uh, I'd counsel against this choice of language just because the regime is not properly conceived as situated temporally prior to cosmic expansion. And it leads to slippery statements about things like a first initial data surface following the supposed epoch. Now, in fact, as will come up shortly, at least in the context of cosmological space times, the exit from the Planck regime is perhaps better pictured as a spatially compact time-like hypersurface, which is defined relative to any choice of inertial stationary observer in the space time. And Robert calls this a new physics hypersurface, which is something I'll come back to. So the Planck regime, which is something defined uh, with respect to a choice of stationary observer about whom expansion occurs, uh, thereby refers to a well-defined region within the spacetime. Within that region, we do not trust the theory to be descriptively accurate. Moreover, assuming cosmic expansion is always strictly positive, the normalized spatial volume of that region uh, goes to zero over cosmic time in co-moving coordinates. So this asymptotic reasoning suggests one sense in which our ignorance about what goes on in the Planck regime uh, with regards to our universe is possibly of diminishing importance with cosmic time. And I'll, I'll note here that all of this technically amounts to imposing a frame on the space time, which is independent of cosmic expansion. Uh, but that's totally fine. Or at the very least, we need that frame anyway to define the notion of scale 
in the background when we want to help ourselves to talk about effective field theories in early universe cosmology, despite a rapidly expanding spatiotemporal background. And in fact, really, to even call quantum gravity higher energy physics is basically already helping ourselves uh, to this extra structure on the cosmological space time. Now, uh, as I already covered, inflation is immensely popular today as a particular inference concerning high energy particle physics, which came about by leveraging progress at the boundary shared by early universe and late stage cosmology. One can thereby speculate that quantum gravity within the Planck regime may be constrained similarly by the expectations that that physics uh, seeds the relevant conditions within early universe cosmology, and it seeds them at the exit from the Planck regime. So in the particular case of inflationary cosmology, this is to inquire, well, how does the physics operating within the Planck regime give rise to the conditions associated with inflation in our remote past? So in other words, just as inflation in early universe cosmology is constrained by the classical initial data that it must output for late stage cosmology. One may take the relevant model of inflation itself within our cosmic history as that which the Planck regime must output for early universe cosmology. But now, as I mentioned already, the exit from the Planck regime considered as a surface uh, in a cosmological spacetime, it's not space-like as is true of recombination but it's instead plausibly time-like, spatially compact and defined relative to an observer. So uh, maybe something like holographic approaches could be attractive here, which enforce a correspondence between any bulk region of a space-time and its boundary. Uh, but I'll set that aside as entirely speculative. In any case, I've just suggested that quantum gravity in the Planck regime constitutes a target of investigation that we hope to learn about in virtue of the role it plays seeding conditions at the exit from the Planck regime within early universe cosmology. And I've been trying to paint this picture in such a way that given the inference to structure formation in the early universe, the study of the Planck regime is just a natural follow-up. And in both cases, the essential insight is supposed to be that autonomy may be denied in a controlled manner along particular surfaces serving as boundaries to fruitful ends. Increasingly high energy physics matters to understanding the evolution of large scale cosmic structure observed today. In the first case, it matters in virtue of structure formation at recombination. In the second case, it matters in virtue of affecting the means of structure formation at the exit from the Planck regime. But there's at least one major disanalogy between the two cases, uh, essentially stemming from the time-like nature of the exit from the Planck regime. And that is that the latter is plagued by the trans-Planckian problem in cosmology. So the phrase trans-Planckian seems to come out first in the context of Hawking radiation. But the earliest discussion I've found of the trans-Planckian problem in cosmology, that is trans-Planckian physics mattering within the context of cosmological space times. Uh, it's actually from 1968 and written in 1967 by Hawking and Ellis. And this is in the final paragraph of the conclusion of their paper, which first tied together the CMB observations to the assumptions that get made in the Penrose and Hawking singularity theorems, which were only a couple of years old at the time. Now I've gone ahead and transcribed nearly the full paragraph in the next slide. So sorry if it's too overwhelming compared to my usual slide aesthetic. Uh, but you'll see in the quote, the time-like surface that I was just talking about as the exit from the Planck regime. And you'll see that they're really talking about uh, what before I called a Planck-ish regime. So here's the quote. However, it may be that for lengths smaller than this, a manifold structure is not appropriate for describing space-time. Thus, it seems that we should draw a surface around regions where the radius of curvature is less than, say, an observational bound at the time. On our side of the surface, a manifold picture of space-time would be appropriate, 
but we have no idea what structure space-time would have on the other side. Uh, further, a curvature at that observational bound corresponds to a pretty crazy density. Uh, and for practical purposes, this might well be regarded as a singularity. Here's the important bit. Matter crossing the surface could be thought of as entering or leaving the universe, and there would be no reason why that entering should balance that leaving. In the presence of such a surface, the Cauchy evolution problem would be indeterminate since new information would be entering the universe across the surface. These remarks on the nature of the singularity are rather speculative. So speculatively, there is a naked time-like singularity located at some vague small distance off a spatial origin. Unitary evolution is not guaranteed, nor is determinism in any classical sense. So what I take from that slide is that the idea of the Transplankian problem in cosmology is old, even understood as stated in terms basically like that of Robert's new physics hypersurface, given a frame imposed on the cosmological space-time. And really, it's nice to see such a sharp description of Transplankian physics uh, at so early a period in recent history. As quantum gravity relative to an observer spoiling descriptions of large-scale cosmology, which are otherwise spelled out in terms of Cauchy problems, or other things like the unitary evolution of quantum fields, which are going to be parasitic on there being well-behaved Cauchy horizons underneath where the quantum field is defined. And in fact, there are really two versions now of the Transplankian problem in cosmology today, by my reckoning. Uh, because of the split between early universe and late stage cosmology, which hadn't happened yet in the 60s. So the strong problem, what I'm calling the strong problem, has to do with late stage cosmology. But I'm going to set it aside. Uh, I can say more later if there's interest, but Transplankian censorship is really, I think, best thought about as concerning what I'm calling the weak problem, having supposed that the strong one is just a non-issue. And that's why at the very beginning of the talk, I mentioned I was setting aside dark energy and its relationship to Transplankian censorship. So first though, let me say a bit more explicitly what is Transplankian physics. Uh, so this refers to the following conceivable scenario. There exist classical physical degrees of freedom in descriptions of the late stage universe whose origins are quantum processes that are above uh, some high, arbitrary high energy cutoff where quantum gravity is taken to reign. Now, setting aside the strong problem, I'm going to focus on the scenario where any such Transplankian physics is already assumed to be present at recombination, having originated in the early universe. And this assumption is what brings us right away to what I've identified as the second version of the Transplankian problem in cosmology, the weak problem. Namely, how might we recognize the presence of Transplankian physics in our empirical descriptions of the early universe. That is, so that the seeds of large-scale cosmic structure present at recombination include empirical windows into quantum gravity stemming from the Planck regime. So now, as discussed earlier, our theory of early universe cosmology takes the form of a semi-classical interpretation of quantum field theory on curved space-time. Uh, where the relevant construction additionally semi-classically sources cosmic expansion in the background. So let me say a bit more about this sliding uh, seamlessly into the effective field theory worldview. So these high energy constructions are supposed to wear Mike, their old survival. You, can I just ask a yeah. clarification question before you go on? Mm -hmm. So the Hawking and Ellis quotation, they were talking about something like a black hole scenario rather than an initial singularity, right? But you, you are talking about both? Uh, no, I, I, by my reading, this is uh, Hawking and Ellis talking about um, they're coming to terms with the Big Bang model, including a genuine singularity. And this is a remark they make along the way. So this is a cosmological space time, not a black hole. Uh, you're uh, correct if in the back of your mind you're thinking, oh, Transplankian problem. Historically, that's a problem with Hawking radiation. Um, and that's, I think, the origin of the phrase transplankian uh, is from that discussion of Hawking radiation. Um, but if we read into that quote that I put up on the slide, 
as effectively what we're talking about when we talk about the transplanking problem in cosmology, then in that sense, this problem is older than the black hole. Uh, right, so effective field theory worldview. Um, these high energy constructions relevant in early inverse cosmology are supposed to wear their ultraviolet frequency cutoffs uh, on their sleeves. In the context of infected field theory, this can be formalized as a stipulation that all further degrees of freedom above that high energy ultraviolet cutoff have been absorbed into coupling constants within the relevant construction. But in the context of quantum field theory on curved spacetime, as is specifically relevant in cosmology, um, and understood as an attempt to semi-classically approximate the effects of quantum gravity in the presence of quantum fields, we simply proceed by assuming that there's some cutoff scale. And the upshot is that we declare artificially a frequency mode above which we throw out any information within the construction. So information that we do not trust to be descriptively accurate on the basis that we lack a field theory of quantum gravity that happens to agree with those descriptions and from which we can explicitly recover the QFT construction as a low energy effective field theory. But in some of those constructions, time evolving backwards certain modes present at future infinity that are below the cutoff reveals that they ought to have begun their lifetimes above the cutoff. And this is the connection to the uh, Hawking radiation origins of the phrase transplanking. So following the prescription just given, uh, these transplankian modes are simply going to be discarded at the onset, in which case their sub cutoff effects at late stages are deemed artifacts of the construction which are not descriptive, even though they're below the cutoff scale. So transplankian modes are artifacts of the ultraviolet regime within a quantum field theory on curved spacetime construction. We don't trust them to be accurate of low energy physics. Uh, precisely because we do not trust the ultraviolet regime of the construction to be accurate of high energy physics. Now, in 2013, Robert and a co-author, Martin, formalized this state of affairs, at least in the context of cosmological spacetimes, in an elucidating way, uh, helping themselves to that spatially compact time-like hypersurface that I've identified as the exit from the Planck regime. And in this picture, the role of that exit as something like an initial data surface is made explicit, albeit with respect to an observer about whom cosmic expansion may be set to And their idea is to consider arbitrary modes radiating off of the surface into the cosmological spacetime, uh, similar to what Hawking and Ellis were talking about, as fluctuations in the effective field theory uh, with respect to that observer, which can be responsible for structure formation. And again, I've set aside the strong problem, which has to do with the same picture I've just described in late stage cosmology, where things are just classical rather than effective field theory. And so whatever are the conditions along the exit from the Planck regime, uh, whenever they are well described in terms of a semi-classical theory of perturbations radiating off of it, it must be that those perturbations either do not classicalize in which case they don't seed the evolution of large scale cosmic structure, or else they just so happen to agree with the physics dictated by the relevant low energy construction. So in other words, either there is no record of transplanking physics at recombination, or else our usual model of structure formation is by coincidence predictive of a regime that it was explicitly engineered so as not to predict. So that's the weak transplanking problem in cosmology. In order to leverage our usual understanding of the early universe, so as to empirically constrain quantum gravity research, we must assume our model of the early universe is predictive of a regime it was not meant to predict. So taking this assumption to be implausible, an abuse of the usual formalism that we otherwise usually take to describe the early universe, one concludes that there just is no transplankian physics in the early universe that would come to seed the evolution of large scale cosmic structure at recombination. Early universe cosmology is autonomous with regards to quantum gravity and the Planck regime. What this means is empirical claims from cosmology about structure formation 
purportedly fail to constrain theory development in quantum gravity in any substantive way. Uh, much like a solid wooden table fails to be all that informative of a theory of quantum gravity. And so that's the setup. And now we arrive at the conjecture. Uh, so as I'll now discuss, Transplankian censorship has the effect of just turning this predicament on its head. The conjecture amounts to a declaration, the bare fact that denying autonomy in our usual high energy theorizing about structure formation is untenable. Well, that is itself a substantive empirical constraint on our theorizing about quantum gravity. So per the conjecture, it's due to facts about our universe within the Planck regime as assessed relative to the observer. That is to be understood according to the future theory of quantum gravity, that we may regard structure formation in the early universe as inevitably autonomous when considered as an effective field theory relative to that same observer. So our empirical descriptions of large scale cosmic structure get to be rendered ultimately as quantum gra gravitational phenomena. And so now this was the slogan I gave before, but now I'll provide the original presentation of the conjecture by the actual physicists involved, uh, which is only slightly more technical. Uh, so we conjecture that a field theory consistent with a quantum theory of gravity does not lead to a cosmological expansion. Sounds good. Um, where any perturbation with length scale greater than the Hubble radius traces back to transplankian scales at an earlier time. So the spirit of the conjecture is pretty transparent um, once you get down into the details of it. So the, the perturbations here are the things that, at least in the context of inflationary cosmology, th these are what actually seed the evolution of large scale cosmic structure at recombination. And in the framework relevant to early universe cosmology, the high energy framework I've been describing, they come from quantum fluctuations, which are co-moving or growing with cosmic expansion uh, relative to an origin, which can spontaneously classicalize when they're larger than the Hubble radius defined about that choice of spatial origin. So the conjecture rules out by fiat the possibility that any quantum fluctuations that classicalize in this way encode the effects of quantum gravitational physics deep within our remote past. Constructions that do otherwise are simply inconsistent with the future theory of quantum gravity sought and presently being developed. There just is some feature of the quantum gravitational physics that is present in the Planck regime within our universe relative to an observer, which spoils how long a period of rapid expansion in the early universe could last. Nature precludes it. So in this way, note how the weak version of the Transplankian problem is just circumvented by fiat, by stipulation, in fact. Supposing the conjecture, Transplankian physics fails to become observable content within late stage cosmology, at least consequent to facts about structure formation in the early universe. For this reason, the conjecture is manifestly a conjecture that our usual understanding of structure formation in the early universe is autonomous with regards to the quantum gravitational physics, which is thought to govern the Planck regime. What seeds late stage cosmology is merely, necessarily, high energy physics below the Planckian cutoff. And crucially, the conjecture states that it is because of quantum gravity that this is so, rather than by cosmic accident. So now this of course takes for granted that it makes sense to talk about quantum field theory on curved space-time constructions being consistent or inconsistent with a theory of quantum gravity, absent recourse to the latter currently in advance of its own development. This is to say, our wielding the conjecture involves our taking for granted that we know what it means in quantum gravity research to conclude that the relevance of some quantum field theory constructions at low energies can just be discarded in virtue of facts that will be identified about higher energy physics. Meanwhile, other constructions persist as descriptive of possible physics at low energies in virtue of those same future facts. 
And the point here is that consistency must mean something other than logical consistency, but nor can it mean something as weak as approximation. Some possibilities in the limit need to be ruled out by the very means available to articulate the appropriate limit in the first place. So elsewhere, I've argued that making assumptions about the future theory of quantum gravity soft is just an ordinary state of affairs, run of the mill in the course of developing such a future theory. What's already being assumed here in taking the conjecture on board is that there are tools analogous to those known in string theory as swampland conjectures. So in a sentence, swampland conjectures are technical conjectures in string theory that they're fail to be stringy ultraviolet completions of whole families of effective field theories, which exhibit certain characteristic properties. And the point I'd like to make here is merely that if there are analogs to these technical conjectures in one's quantum gravity approach, then one may conceivably make use of the Transplankian censorship conjecture in the course of developing future physics. Uh, we could talk about that in discussion if there's interest. Uh, for now, I just want to stress that this last pitch, extracting the notion of swampland to be sensible and useful outside of just string theory, it isn't my invention. It isn't just a philosopher's invention. Uh, here's a passage in the conclusion of a recent massive review article presenting the swampland, which gets at something very similar. So um, while string theory has played and will continue to play a central role in the swampland program, Ideally, we would like to be able to formulate the underlying physics as general properties of quantum gravity. This is in some sense in the spirit of ADS-CFT, which started life as a specific example in string theory, but is now studied in a much more general way. It would be fantastic if the ideas underlying the Swampland program eventually reached such a mature stage. So I'm basically out of time. Uh, but you've hopefully seen a little of how Transplankian censorship uh, could help empirically constrain quantum gravity research, uh, provided that one ensures that the relevant conditions of theorizing are met within their chosen candidate quantum gravity approach. So in particular, the Transplankian censorship conjecture amounts to an empirically grounded speculation about quantum gravity within the Planck regime in our universe as is relevant to affecting the means of structure formation as we usually understand the subject and relative to a choice of origin in early universe cosmology. And this lets us regard our empirically constrained understanding of early universe cosmology as itself an empirical constraint on the quantum gravitational physics that's relevant within the Planck regime in our universe. But it, as a matter of fact, in order to help oneself to that conjecture, uh, in the course of one's quantum gravity research, you really do need something analogous to the swampland familiar in string theory. So you need to impose that sort of theoretical structure in your developing theory in order to subsequently entertain uh, these empirical constraints on the quantum gravity regime. So I'll stop here, thanks. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, so that was great. So, okay, so we'll, uh, questions, can people, again, I see one way to do it is go to the participants um, panel and you should find a, a hand to raise it in there. That's a nice way to help me keep track of people. Um, but if people want to post questions in the chat as well, I will work those in. Okay, well, I see a question from Antonio first, if you want to go ahead, just unmute yourself and ask. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, very interesting talk. And now, I'm not familiar with the, uh, with the literature, so I don't know, my, my question my sound, may sound uh, naive, but I was um, um, wondering um, if uh, the coherence uh, plays uh, a role in, uh, in the discussion. Because uh, uh, usually uh, when uh, we want to, um, let's say, uh, uh, append the uh, formation of the seeds of, of cosmic structure from an inflationary uh, um, epoch, 
Um, some people uh, use uh, the, uh, the coherence uh, mechanism in order to make sense of this uh, structure uh, formation. Now, it may be the case that uh, we can invoke uh, the coherence mechanism to explain also these uh, uh, transplantian uh, censorship hypothesis in the sense that uh, when uh, this decoherence happens, uh, uh, the transplant regime is in some sense washed away uh, from uh, uh, the, uh, let's say, cosmic structure uh, formation in some sense is hidden uh, in, uh, uh, by this, uh, this kind of uh, uh, mechanism. I don't know what you think about that. Uh, so I'll respond with uh, something on the level of an anthropological response, uh, which is to say I am not laying cards on the table on my views on how either decoherence or measurement problem type worries should be handled in cosmology. Uh, but this is the, um, the views that I think are going on in the relevant community. Uh, so there's this classic idea of decoherence without decoherence uh, that gets talked about in this context where um, essentially what you have going on here is that uh, in the semi-classical perturbation theory, uh, the sorts of uh, classical modes that you would care about are the ones that are super helpful. And that's because they're frozen and they don't become negligible uh, with rapid inflationary dynamics. But now you can take uh, and you can take your quantum modes that are super Hubble and decompose them into a term that is on average completely compatible with the background symmetries, so the isotropy of the spacetime, and the excess bits. And those excess bits are going to be very, very sub -hubble. And so what happens is very rapidly, the um, sub -hubble modes are effectively trivial. And so you have decoherence against an environment uh, and you get just those large modes. Uh, and so this is why in, in the language that they're using and what I put back on the slide, the actual summary of the conjecture, um, the modes that are being worried about as potential seeds of structure formation are just the ones that at some point as quantum modes uh, either classicalized or either classicalized at sufficiently large wavelengths or decohered with respect to their own irregularities uh, at super Hubble wavelengths. I don't know, to be honest, how a more sophisticated treatment of this part of the discussion, this the link between the use of the semi-classical perturbation theory and the empirical record. Uh, I don't know if a more sophisticated treatment of that would dig up other ways of cashing out the discussion. Okay, Chris, you had a question. Uh, thank you, yes. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, this all sounds very convincing to me. I'm wondering how that this idea of, a tra of the transplankian censorship conjecture being a, a constraint on, on a possible theories of quantum gravity is related to the more uh, general problem of in some sense of the emergence of space time from quantum gravity uh, and in particular, you know, in, in an article published, uh, I think about two years ago, Nick and I tried to distinguish sort of two ways in which you can understand this emergence, one of which is a sort of an atemporal or non-temporal sense of uh, relationship between the, the, the effective uh, classical, less fundamental theory with a more fundamental theory of quantum gravity. Um, and compared to that, some, in some sense, a temporal uh, emergence of space-time, which you find in, in early uh, cosmology, of course. And 
it seems to me that I'm curious to hear your opinion uh, about that, that this uh, transplant and censorship conjecture might be a more specific way of giving a condition for such a temporal version of uh, the emergence of space-time uh, and perhaps at least may give a necessary, even though perhaps not sufficient condition, actually it may not even be strictly necessary, but something in that direction. Um, I mean, I, I don't know, it's, it's very open-ended, but I'm curious to hear what you think about this. Right, so um, I suppose I, I have a, a cluster of thoughts and none of them individually is as well-formed as I'd like, but maybe in collection, they'll be interesting. Uh, the first is I have a general difficulty grasping the temporal emergence of space-time uh, as read off of the view of early universe cosmology that happens in the sort of inflation effective field theory setting. Um, this is not the case, so I don't have a difficulty sort of conceptualizing what the problem at hand is in Lambda CDM, where um, it seems pretty clear that you're backing up through cosmic time about any observer and eventually you're gonna hit the sort of moment when you want to switch to perhaps a pre-spatio-temporal theory. Um, but because the setup when doing high energy, a high energy framework for early universe cosmology um, involves a notion of energy scale in the background what I describe is the frame that you've imposed on the cosmological space-time. My thinking on this problem always sends me back into thinking about uh, not diachronic emergence, but the sort of all at once emergence version. Um, and so it might be the case that how we think about what the early, what the high energy early universe is will change the discussion one way or the other uh, about what sort of emergence account we'd be satisfied with uh, in the early universe. Uh, so that's one part of the cluster of thoughts. The other one is uh, I've been recently having a lot of trouble disentangling when uses of the phrase Planck regime are metaphorically supposed to be pre spatiotemporal versus the sort of with respect to an arbitrary spatial origin in a reference space time. But of course, if it's the Planck regime where you don't have access to space in the conventional sense, it's not clear how that full story will go. Um, and so the trouble I've had tracking claims in that conversation has sort of back propagated into my thinking about this, the, the first cluster of comments. Uh, does that help as far as a perspective goes? Uh, yeah, no, thank you very much. That's, that, that is very um, uh, helpful. It, I mean, generally, I think you could ask the question, what is, you know, you, 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 you've sort of insinuated at some point what the, the role of, of the absence or presence of space-time might be in this, but of course, you know, none of this is a very tight connection. And one might think a little bit more, you know, trying to develop an understanding of what the relationship between these two sort of a priori separate questions might be. Yeah, um, I, I think you're right in that regard. Um, yeah, I think part of the, uh, just to throw another connection into a different part of the talk. So I mentioned that I view this project as the other side of the same coin as how Robert was setting his up, which is from the terms of the conjecture to getting away from inflation. Um, I think it's, there, there's something interesting in this conversation about uh, the reality of the early universe as it's being used uh, in two different conversations, uh, which sort of further complicates the discussion. 
Um, and what I mean by that is something like uh, Robert, given his interest, is deeply invested in uh, working out what happened in the early universe. Uh, effective field theory worldview type proponents often espouse a more detached relationship with reality in some respect, where they're looking for the effective field theory that gets all of the right dynamics, uh, which would be just as good as an account of, say, the early universe. Um, and it might be that this conversation is easier conducted on one of those sides than the other side. I'm not sure which side, but. Good. Um, John, I have you next. And I see a question in the chat for after that as well. Um, thank you. This is really cool. I have a question about the connection you drew at the end between this and Swampland and sort of ADS CFT stuff. Um, so my question is about the role of these principles in investigation and their justification. Um, so it sounded, if I understood your discussion of the Transplankian censorship conjecture, the idea is Broadly speaking, it's an empirical justification. Um, we don't see sort of in our telescopes <laughs> any effects of transplantian modes. And so one way to get an early uh, quantum theory or a early universe cosmology that pr reproduces what we see is to sort of make sure that it enforces on itself this kind of censorship. Um, whereas I understand duality or swan plan things is generated either by sort of uh, computational convenience is maybe an overly deflationary way of saying it, but something like this. Um, or like just really general, this seems kind of reasonable to me. Um, and I think both these sort of more empirically motivated ones and these more theoretically motivated ones are good principles for different sorts of things. Um, but like, suppose that um, uh, well, right. So the, the, I guess the question that I'm sort of ending up at is like, how do I go about convincing somebody else that they should adopt this transplantian censorship conjecture and like what effect should it have on their investigation? And specifically what I'm interested in is, do you think the answers to those differ from the answers in the Swampland or ADS CFT case? Um, so there are some uh, tricky parts of this sort of question. When, when I hear this question, there strike me as some tricky parts. Uh, the first is the carving, which I am fully guilty of. And so this isn't in the, just in how you've structured the question, it's, it's we all take part in it. Uh, the carving up of empirical and theoretical um, in the midst of developing a uh, future theory is I think like we, we always need to be careful how, what things we're reifying in the sort of argumentative structure of the conversation um, when we help ourselves to these. And the reason why I preface any answer I give with that uh, is because I think oftentimes the, uh, the distinction gets blurred between heuristic uh, practical assumptions that we identify as sort of pre-theoretic constraints and which parts of our empirical record we immediately we are predisposed to think are the relevant bits that we need to get right. Um, and so I think Swampland conjectures in general are really interesting on this front. Um, so in the context of a particular approach, so say string theory, which would be the Swampland ones, uh, there's something really interesting going on where uh, theorists are generalizing from sort of difficulties developing toy models of particular effective field theories to generalizing to a class of them that have those salient properties and are concluding that um, somehow that cannot be uh, possible physics at low energies in a universe conditional on string theory being ultimately what is going on. Uh, that's a powerful sort of tool when you turn to the question of what sort of empirical data are we going to let be the important bits that we attune our theorizing to. Because once you have that sort of tool, you can 
I think, help yourself to, in some ways, a much broader spectrum of empirical reasoning as constraints on your theorizing. Um, to get to the specific part of your question of like, what could you say to someone? Why should they embrace cosmic, or sorry, excuse me, transplanting and censorship in particular? Um, the idea here is set aside the cosmological windows into quantum gravity that you get from black hole physics, that you get from the dark sector, arguably. Um, set aside the possibility of primordial rotation and uh, electromagnetic winds and all sorts of other setups. Just look at the uh, evolution of structure part of the story we tell of cosmology. If you want to start talking about that as uh, in themselves empirical constraints on quantum gravity, if you want to call structure itself, as we usually talk about it, quantum gravitational phenomena, I think the Transplanckian censorship conjecture is a very immediate way. You can do so helping yourself to the sort of developments that have happened in inflation. Uh, but if you're off the board, say, of inflation, it's going to get trickier to justify embracing it. If you're off the board of all of early universe cosmology, then it's going to get difficult to embrace it. Uh, and I think it's no accident that the communities that are off the board with inflation and other early universe settings lean more heavily on the black hole and dark sector stuff. Awesome, thanks, that was super helpful. I think I'm just gonna let myself put a finger on that. I do wanna come back to the chat question. Um, so uh, maybe the way you've said to John kind of makes this sort of less relevant, but I take it, this is sort of thinking about Brandenburger's talk, Robert's talk last, uh, last time and what you said and the, the relation of this to the swap land. Um, could you say a bit more just about the relationship between sort of what's going on in the Swampland ideas and, and the TCC? Because it sort of seems as if, I guess what it occurred to me is, well, look, if the Swampland already enforces the TCC, then we're not getting any extra sort of constraints on theory development. We just take, we're just taking what the Swampland is already telling us. And he kind of, I think, I think Robert kind of presented it in that light presented the swamp land as a justification. So it doesn't then if, if it's justified by it, it doesn't seem like it's an independent constraint. So what's what's the logic there? Um, so I think the, the way I've been understanding at least a substantive ch chunk of the argument structure going on here is that they're so embracing the conjecture if you are a string theorist, means locating the swampland conjecture or the maybe small collection. I don't know how you take unions of conjectures in this context, but uh, you take, you find the particular swampland conjecture or conjectures that witness the um, transplanting and censorship conjecture. Uh, and so this would be filling in the, the sense in which conjecturally nature precludes the physical relevance of various effective field theories in the context of early universe cosmology. Well, by conjecture, there's this aspect of the swampland. These conjectures, sorry, these effective field theories reside in the swampland rather than the landscape would be in the string theory context, the way of fleshing out the nature precludes clause. Um, and I put, I have this slide up as in the way that uh, Bedroya and Vafa are talking about it. Um, they're trying to present this generally, not as string theory, but they're showing their cards here, which they're using language that string theorists do have a definite referent to. String theorists know what they mean in virtue of the swampland landscape conversation to spell out what it means to be consistent with the theory that they plan on finishing developing. Um, in other approaches, there will just have to be some sort of analog to fill in this bolded condition or to fill in the nature precludes clause. 
Okay, so the rhetorical structure is something along the lines of, well, we already, you know, people are already interested in the swampland conject in swampland conjectures, but we don't exactly know what the weather swampland is. So on the one hand, we're just saying what we're saying is kind of compatible with that line of thinking. Uh, but moreover, we're saying something more specific about, uh, you know, at least something about where the swampland is. Yes. Yeah. We're demanding that a relevant collection of low energy physical possibilities resides in the analog to the swampland within the context of our future theories. Great. Um, so I see N Femto has a question. I could, would you like me to read it out or would you like to ask it yourself? Um, I can read it out. Uh, so I question. was asking asking them actually. So That's it. <laughs> I'm not sure who the N is. Uh, yeah, please, uh, you can read it or I can ask it again. Uh, so if you introduce a spatially compact time-like hypersurface, as you describe, uh, is it the temporary stage in the early universe which you need or uh, is it still there and which dimension do you adjust to it? Uh, um, so in this talk, yeah, so it's a good question. In this talk, because I set aside what I call the strong transplankian problem, uh, the way I'm talking about it is it does sound like a temporary stage. It's the part that is filling in our, you know, his semi-classical uh, history up to recombination is where it's going on. But I think in sort of a full treatment of this whole conversation about transplankian physics, it uh, it's always there centered about the stationary observer whose you know physical volume element you're transporting to get the sense in which the universe is heating up as you're going backwards um, and in that respect it's it's going to be at least as I'm understanding it it's, it's a proper spatial three sphere um, about a stationary origin point stationary spatial origin point um, now the, the conversation is a bit stranger because as you're transport, as you're talking about the universe contracting and heating up as you move backwards about that point, um, eventually you're going to hit the regime where things are too hot for you to be trusting the descriptive relevance of uh, that spatial region continuing to be the place of the observer. Uh, and this is where so we get back to Chris's uh, question at the beginning, but um, but I think accepting those extreme cases in the very very early universe, uh, this is just a ordinary frame that sort of persists as a sphere through time. A three sphere in the three sphere, then? Yes, the, this is how I'm understanding it. At least it, I'm I'm reconstructing. Uh, okay. A lot of the conversation. So, and uh, so you are. Uh, what kind of uh, what or higher order is it then? How many dimensions do you need for a three sphere in a three sphere? Um, I, so I'm, I'm assuming we're in a because I'm helping myself to a standard cosmological space time. We're in four dimensions, and this is just picking out. Uh, along any moment in cosmic time. So in a three space, which will be sort of a, a Euclidean, it'll be isotropic, so well-behaved. There is just a Euclidean. Uh, Four dimensional sphere. universe, you mean? Um, so in a four-dimensional space time, we restricted to a three-dimensional hypersurface at any moment in time, and you, I say that is my issue. I should not have Thank been saying you. three sphere. Thank you. Uh, yeah, that's all, I think I'm still not kind of clear. Is there a, like a Penrose diagram of this in the Hawking and Ellis paper or something like, like that? I'm trying to. 
um, sort of picture. From the way you just described it, it sort of sound. You know, the, the thought one has then is that can't one go go back through? You know, go back through it. Um, so, for instance, you know, if the universe recontracted and collapsed, would would that mean that there was sort of a continuous? This was a continuous surface from. The, the the big bang to the big crunch and we just end up going back through it is that is that the sort of thing uh yeah so i i, I don't believe there is a diagram of this because this is the final paragraph in which they're helping themselves to be more speculative than they've allowed themselves to be through um and likewise when when so robert gives his talk and he talks about the new physics hypersurface it's just a line it's a vertical line his pictures that's one plank plank ish off the spatial origin. Um, we get this remark that matter crossing the surface may be thought of as entering or leaving the universe. Uh, I'm taking this to be, yes, it is extended in the case of an oscillating universe. Uh, we again and again enter it and leave it. Uh, so this, the last dot dot dots in this slide refer to um, there's a sentence where Hawking and Ellis express the speculative possibility that this scenario could address the problem of entropy in oscillating models, which arguably is also a problem in non-oscillating models, depending on how you're thinking of it. But it's certainly a problem in oscillating models. Um, and so they are thinking of this as something that we are entering and leaving repeatedly in an oscillating scenario. Um, does anybody else have questions? I do have a, I guess I've had a couple of fingers on things that I asked. Um, so Julius, go ahead. Hi, thanks Mike, that was super fun. Um, mm. But since you mentioned the word entropy, uh, I feel justified in bringing the following up. I didn't, so didn't classic... include it on the slide. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, no, I, what, what I meant to say is in classical GR, we have a bunch of uh, various conjectures about um, what happens as we approach the singularity. Right, so we have the BKL conjecture on, or we have the Val curvature hypothesis. And I just generally wanted to ask you um, about whether and to what extent they relate to the trans planking ideas. Should we think of those sorts of conjectures as to a degree orthogonal to the problem? Or do you know if there are some sort of um, known relationships with dependencies between these topics uh, and the trans and conjecture. And of course, in many cases, this amounts to a modification of a scenario, right? Because uh, uh, BKL seems to hold in uh, somewhat anisotropic models, for instance, but that wouldn't, on its own, that shouldn't be a problem. But this sort of, we seem to be maybe living with a nice, uh, you know, FLRW Lambda CDM setup in that case. Um, so I don't think any connections have been made to the censorship conjecture. That might just be in virtue of it being only a year old. Um, there are obvious connections to be drawn here. Uh, so for instance, uh, yeah, so the, the mixed master <laughs> conjectures um, have been studied in the context of loop quantum gravity, I know, where uh, at least in one paper that uh, Ashtakar is one of the co-authors on, um, it's explicitly motivated in the introduction as uh, there is a problem with the Planck regime. We should move to the sort of uh, quantum space time that we get in our particular candidate quantum gravity approach. So, or in fact, loop quantum cosmology, but motivated by loop quantum gravity to uh, ask the question, how does the conditions at the exit from the Planck regime uh, give rise to our favorite model of say inflation uh, or give rise to a scenario for early universe cosmology that ends with the conditions that are taken to be present at recombination. 
Um, so that, that's a bit of an older project. I mean, that's well before the new conjecture, but it's around the same time as uh, Brandenburger and Martin's paper that makes explicit the new physics hypersurface language. Um, so I think that the connection is there both implicitly and perhaps in the air in the community at the time. Uh, they should certainly be related in some respects. Uh, whether we want to turn to uh, the effective field theory worldview branding of the early universe uh, as a domain of research, uh, whether that gives us the resources to step away from those conjectures in GR into some new conjectures is I think also an interesting question that I don't know the answer to, uh, but conceivably I could imagine there being an argument of the form once we've adopted this perspective on what is the early universe that we are studying, uh, rather than engaging with uh, conjectures about the structure of space-time as you get to high energies, we're instead going to consider conjectures about what happens when you get to high energy scales in our effective theory. Uh, that could be an argument that I could imagine being given, uh, which would be explicitly cleaving off the two subjects. Right. But I, I don't know. This, because this is recorded and streamed on YouTube, I guess. But uh, in a way, BK, like if, if I seriously believe in something like BKL, that would, in a way, go against the idea of treating this regime as autonomous, right? Uh, so BKL would be what the, the time derivatives dominate, and so you can yeah, just... Yeah. Um, yeah. near singularity. You might get into a... Uh, yeah, so, so here, here's one speculative thing that could be that like I could imagine seeing an article espousing this sort of view. Um, in our, in, say, in the loop quantum case, there's a sort of impressionistic argument coming from loop quantum cosmology that uh, the BKL conjecture is essentially true of loop quantum space times. And so conditional on that being our approach, we just have an entirely new way of talking about early universe cosmology, which is separate. Maybe it mimics inflation because of other dynamics having to do with the relevant matter fields. But, but yeah, that would be an entirely different use of a similar part of the empirical record, um, which just doesn't intersect with this. OK, I think I will just a little couple more minutes. I'm, I'm just going to ask what I had in mind. And this kind of goes back actually to what um, some the line of questions that John had. So, you know, it sort of seems to me things would have been better, you know, given this sort of EFT picture and your whole picture, if there were sort of subplunk here, you know, early universe subplunk effects that got blown up above the Hubble length, because then we could look at them and we'd know something about the subplunk physics, right? So the picture here, see, so, you know, the pic, so what it seems is, well, we don't have that. So let's kind of elevate this, uh, you know, defect into a kind of principle and now look for an explanation of this thing. Or is there something a bit more that really it would be, was incoherent to think that that was going to happen kind of in the first place in some way? Um, so I think it's the latter. And that's why I wavered my hands when you said that first part. Uh, this is so um, in the questions period when I was asking Robert a question the last talk, uh, he made the comment that essentially why he doesn't like going in the direction that I've been going in uh, was that inflation was proposed to address a fine tuning problem. And so if we now need to fine tune previous things to get the solution to the fine tuning problem, that's sort of self defeating in, as a rhetorical structure. Um, now, I mentioned that because it's, it's relevant here. Namely, the, the trans Planckian problem in early universe cosmology 
is a problem to do with our mode of inferring the conditions that obtained in the early universe. Uh, and so the idea here is we started with a almost uniform, but eventually noted to be anisotrop anisotropic uh, cosmic microwave background, which we traced back to, you know, encoding anisotropies over a very nearly isotropic uh, universe at the time of recombination. Uh, and the game at this point, and sort of as say popularized by Guth's like semi-autobiography book of the discovery of inflation, the game at this point is to get a uh, high energy theory that produces that. And inflation was the mechanism that sort of won out. It's then pointed out that, well, Inflation stretches even subplanckian modes. And so if inflation is true of the early universe, then at least we can argue about what measures are natural, but plausibly, uh, we would expect in that universe where the early universe was inflationary, we would expect uh, to see all of those modes. But that's not ever the possible, the set of possible worlds we're in because we started the entire inference to inflation to deal with not being in one of those worlds and to be instead be in a world which is, you know, very nearly an isotropic, a very nearly isotropic recombination. So uh, I think it is more than just, we didn't notice the signs. And so now we're trying to elevate that into a principle. You know, we didn't notice them for good reasons. Uh, it really is, more steeped in the inference structure that led us to early universe in the first place. Okay, very good, thanks. Yeah, that's helpful. I guess I've heard, heard sort of you and Robert talking about these things several times and I'm kind of, the pieces are sort of fitting into place, I feel, so it's, it's been very helpful. Does anybody else um, have, have a last, uh, question. We're nearly out of time, or if not, I think um, we should just say thanks once more to to Mike. And I think we're done for this this year, right, Chris? There's no, there's not another talk. Oh, no, there is. Um, oh, whoa! So let's advertise that. Yes, it's Nora Boyd uh, who will be talking. Let me look this up very quickly on the 9th of December. So in two weeks from now, we'll have Nora Boyd. Uh, it will be announced through the usual channels. So, so don't just, you know, go away yet. Okay, thanks everybody. And thanks again, Mike. That was a very great talk and great question session. I think it's very useful. Um, Happy to do it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Bye. 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 Bye.